Good morning, everybody. Sound test, can you hear me? Good? Okay. <laughs> Welcome to this uh, webinar about uh, current mode of voltage mode control. It's a very old topic. Um, it's been around a long time, but there's still a lot of confusion about this topic, and hopefully we can try and clear some of that up. And we'll find a way to hopefully move current mode into the future. Uh, some of you are having trouble downloading the second file that's on the screen here. It's Ridley Works Demo 1414. We're not allowed to upload Excel files with macros, so it's a .pdf. Um, we're working on a way to give you somewhere else to get that file from. So hopefully we can do that in the next few minutes. If we don't, then you'll have to watch and not participate and then have a go at uh, what we did later. There will be a recording of the broadcast. And then once you get the recording, you can download the software and uh, play along with, with your version of that. Perhaps it's too much to do it all, all in one live session anyway. Um, we've got a lot of people here. We're just clocking in around 400, 500. Probably one of the biggest gatherings of power electronics engineers during this lockdown. Welcome, everybody. Hope you're all staying safe and healthy. <laughs> We're here in uh, Camarillo in California. Um, still pretty much on lockdown. Call from Cotine Fabrication. <laughs> Bringing in the background, excuse me. <laughs> Call from Cotine Fabrication. Sorry about that. That's a live event. Now we're going to start with uh, talking about uh, current mode, voltage mode. And you should have received an email yesterday to download and install our ReadyWorks demo software. Um, you will need to do this full install here. It says start broadcast. Uh, good morning, everybody. I think I have to start all over again because you weren't um, weren't receiving. Can you indicate on the comments if you are now receiving uh, receiving us? Um, we're going to talk today about current or voltage oh, mode oh, control. Oh, and I've got a phone ringing in my ear right now. Oh, this is a live oh, webinar. <laughs> Call from Call right, there goes the phone. Uh, got 400 people online now. We're heading up towards 500. It's a good gathering of uh, power electronics engineers during this lockdown. We're uh, live from uh, Camry in California, in our offices here, our labs here, and welcome everybody. Uh, we're having a little problem with some of the downloads. The Excel file .pdf apparently is not working for everybody, so we hope to have a different option for doing that for you a little bit later. And let's move on to the next page. Here's, here's an instruction you should have received, and this is in your this is in your the download the the first download the PDF. You can click on these links to do the install of our software. Unfortunately, this morning somebody found a link in there wasn't quite correct, and it's not not clear whether those softwares will be working for you or not. So we're working on resolving that as we go through the presentation here. Let's talk a little bit about control of converters. And we're going to start with voltage mode control. And those of you that have our simulation file, we're open Ridley Works Demo 1414. Now, last time I did a presentation, I was doing a different file to you. Hopefully, if you've got this file, you can follow along. But I may go too fast that you can't quite see where we're going anyway. Notice this time around, I have a great big cursor. Hopefully, that's visible on there. If you can say anything, in the comments then if you see any problems please let us know we've got lots of people answering the questions here let's begin a design so this is our ridley work software and this is a culmination of about 40 years of design experience is inside this software 
and we're just going to do a simple bug converter today and then we're going to talk about more sophisticated aspects of uh, bug converters later on okay and then i'll get it now good all right let's start with the specifications so here we have a buck ridley works demo of 120 watts i think i think we did this one last time we did the webinar it's 36 to 60 volts on the input and 48 volts on the output i'm uh, sorry 48 volts nominal the output voltage is 12 volts at 10 amps so this 48 to 12 application is something that a lot of people are talking about right now and uh, it's very important for the points of load converters um, as we shift to this 48 volt bus when it used to be a 12 volt bus great so here we go we enter in the specs and we go straight from doing the specs and here that summarizes what we've got 120 watts here you get to pick your switching frequency anything you like you want to 100 kilohertz that's fine if you want to do a megahertz that's fine if you want to do five megahertz the program will design with whatever you enter let's start with 100 in here and we have a buck converter these are the other topologies available in our full software we're going to go with the buck converter for this and Somebody's asking the question, a small introduction of voltage mode versus current mode. The way I'm going to do this is I'm going to talk about voltage mode first. Then we're going to talk about current mode, and then we're going to do a back and forth between the two. So we put in the specs. Now what we do is go straight to a simulation. And you see here something strange going on. Okay, there's an oscillation here, it looks like, and we're off scale here. One of the options you have is auto scale. Click auto scale, and now you can see the startup of a converter with voltage mode control. And then there still seems to be a little bit of ringing here. Let's hit continue. And of course, this is our design program with a built in simulator, faster than anybody else's simulator. What is this oscillation here? This is not really oscillation. One of the features we have in this program for you to use and to do your testing with is modulation. So we actually modulate the input bus. So here we're putting a one volt modulation at one kilohertz on the input voltage. Let's turn that off so we don't see that. There we go, okay. And now we hit continue and there's our converter in steady state. Um, you can see there's quite a bit of ripple here. Let's zoom in with that time base, turn that button around. See there's quite a bit of ripple here. Modern converters wouldn't have that much Let's look at the output cap, and we'll change the output cap type from a lower cost electrolytic type, which you might use in the auto industry. Let's, let's say we're going to go more exotic and use a multi-layer ceramic capacitor on here. Click OK, and then we see our output voltage again, continue, and there's our steady state. So we go through startup. Here you can see it overshooting a bit. That's one of the characteristics of voltage mode control. It's a little hard with the type three compensator to deal with that overshoot. And then it comes back into steady state in the converter. Continue, and there we go, go into um, steady state. Just a couple of things on the converter. Let's have a look at the efficiency right now. It's not that great, it's about 94%. And if we want to do better than that, we'll go and take out the diode. So we click on the diode. We say, okay, replace that with the switch with a very low forward drop. So one millivolt. And then let's put in like a seven milliohm device there. Update. Okay. And then hit continue. Now we're continuing to simulate that converter. And the efficiency. Oops, 96, not sure what it was before, but that should have gone up a couple of percent when we went, got rid of the diode in there. Right, so now we have a converter going. Now we want to talk about the control of this converter. And of course, control all comes to looking at first, we've got an LC filter here that we're trying to control. We're putting that through feedback. Click on control design, click on loop, 
you are using voltage mode control. And you will notice our program talks to you now as you're doing some design with it. We're going to turn off the loop here and just look at the filter that we're dealing with. So here is our LC filter of voltage mode control. Uh, students these days, everybody these days, it seems, wants equations and formulas. So we give you equations and formulas. Here's the location, the DC gain, the resonant frequency, the Q, the ESR0. This is a numerical example, obviously, for the components that are chosen. Here's all the formulas that you might want. Go put them in a spreadsheet, put them in MathCAD, put them in MATLAB, whatever you like. And when you spent a week doing that, you can reproduce our curves here. So your choice. Use the equations if you like, or we take care of that for you. This is the characteristic of a buck converter. It looks just like an LC filter. It has some interesting characteristics, like the gain of it, if I move the voltage up and down, let's go down with the voltage here. You see we put these little tweak buttons. You can see the gain of the power stage is shifting down. Right there. And it changes scale. So we can jump from minimum, 36, up to maximum of 60 volts input. And the gain just moves up and down. The phase doesn't do anything interesting here. How do we turn that into a loop? Put compensation around it. So green here is the compensation. Around the resonant frequency of the converter, we put a couple of zeros. And then we put a couple of poles further out to make sure that the loop we get always keeps going down and it goes down harder than you'd want to from just a loop gain point of view but we've got to attenuate the noise on this we can't keep high gain going through this compensator of the system so we just do visual shaping around here of course there are equations that put zeros on top of poles um, use this form to redesign the loop so this is the way we design is we nudge poles and zeros around you can push a zero and raise the gain on the left hand side there, I'll reset. You can push the poles and stop filtering quite so much at the high end to increase your phase margin if you want to. If you go a little too far, if you try increasing the gain too much here on the left, you see our red phase is dropping down a little bit. And if you get to the point here, we're looking at the phase margin where it goes below 45 phase degrees. Phase margin is less than 45 degrees. You'll get a warning from the program if that's happened. So that helps you out. There's a lot of numbers on the screen. So when there's something that you need to pay attention to, we give you a verbal warning on that too. Okay, not gonna focus too much on designing this loop here. That's not the topic of this webinar. It's all about voltage mode versus current mode. But this is an optimally designed loop. This is how we would design it. Crossover frequency is about one tenth of the switching frequency. That's about as high, high as we can go. Um, we can shove the inductor around a little bit. If we push the inductor up, we see the resonance move. If there's any teachers out there, professors, this is a really nice program to use to show your students things moving live rather than static plots. So feel free to take this demo program and use it for your teaching. We'll be happy to see you do that. But we can shove that uh, zero around. We can change the power. So this is full power. And you see not much happens as the power goes down, except the Q here goes up just a little bit. We keep dropping down in power. See that Q gets higher and higher around that point. Whoops, and something happens. Those of you who know voltage mode control will know what's going on there is we're dropping into discontinuous mode. But we'll talk more about that later as well when we talk about uh, current mode. Okay, so that's our loop gain and our power stage transfer function. Customer doesn't really care about the loop gain. He cares about output impedance or step load. So what we have on the on the loop gain is Here's our open loop output impedance, and here's the closed loop output impedance. And you can see we attenuate the output impedance by the magnitude of the loop. And then this here is right around the crossover. So that's our closed loop output impedance. That's gonna determine how well we do on our step loads as well. Um, I'm looking at some of the comments here. 
uh, practical limit for control bandwidth. Who decides what the uh, practical limits out? Uh, <laughs> realistically, I mean, in a research environment and in our labs, and when we teach our labs, sure, you can cross over at one quarter the switching frequency. But once you start doing that on the real converter and you make the real measurements, you find you just start eating into your into your gain margin, and you know, one tenth of the switching frequency is really a practical limit for most of the industry. So you can get more aggressive, but there's always risk with doing that. Somebody asked about the low frequency oscillations that were eliminated. That was, oops, oops, sorry, modulation. If we look at the waveforms, output voltage, and we turn on modulation, there it is. So that's not an oscillation, that's transmission of noise from input through to the output. Okay, we'll turn that off again. We'll come back to that. Okay. All right. So that's our, everything's looking good so far in our control design. The loop looks good, one tenth crossover frequency, plenty of phase margin, nobody worries about that. Um, let's look at the line transmission, audio susceptibility. It's also called PSRR these days, power supply rejection ratio. And here it is, it's the same thing. This is the open loop in blue, and then this is the closed loop in red. And the difference between the red and the blue is the loop gain of the converter. And you see we're getting approximately 40 dB, that's 100 times attenuation of the input voltage perturbation through to the output. Now we can do some things here, by the way. Let's let's go look at that again. If you want to redesign, to redesign the loop. your system a little bit, say, hey, let's lift up the crossover. We do that, and you can see that closed loop audio susceptibility dropping. But as we're doing it, the phase margin is less than 45 degrees. Eventually, you start losing phase margin here. So you just don't push that too hard. And of course, your converter is going to vary over its lifetime. People are going to add capacitance to it. So the ductor is going to change. The temperature is going to change. So we go a little bit conservative only on this. There we go. So that's our audio susceptibility. And now we're going to talk about step load back to the time domain here's our time domain let's change the line and the load and let's do a relatively small step here of 80 percent to 100 percent. so that's a 20 percent step load on the system and there you go there's the response with voltage mode control so it responds over here, it comes back, recovers. Uh, this is not really unstable. It's got about 56 degrees of phase margin here. Um, if you don't like that little overshoot in the other direction, you, Use can, this form to redesign the loop. you can tweak your loop a little bit. You can drop down your zeros. And now we're buying more phase margin. But of course, the overshoot is going up a little bit. So some people may be more comfortable with that kind of response in the system, okay? But it comes at a cost. So this is always a trade-off. It's an artistic process of a little bit more gain here, a little bit more step load, you know, a little bit more phase margin. And you learn how to shape that as an engineer. Uh, it's a bit disconcerting. I know for some students that there isn't one set answer, but it all depends what specs for your power supplies are. Now let's look at that power supply rejection ratio again. So let's get steady state. Boom. Okay. And look at our get back all the way to steady state. Now we're going to put this modulation on the input right here. Okay. It's coming through. And let's suppose you wanted to see not that frequency, you want to see 120 hertz. I'm not sure it's all going to fit on the screen. Let's update. There's 120 hertz modulation. So we'll hit continue. So now you know how much of the line noise gets through to the output. So this is actually 16 millivolts 
peak to peak of the noise getting through from the input voltage through to the output voltage. So that's the general performance of the voltage mode control. Everything's fine, everything looks good. You know, why don't why don't we stay with just voltage mode because it's easy? As digital control comes along and higher frequencies, switching frequencies come along, you know, it can be a little tricky to go to current mode. But if we're compensating this okay, then you know, why don't we stay here? Let me have a little uh Look at your comments here. Somebody's talking about the audio. I don't think we have a second microphone turned on. There's only one person saying that. Loop gain in the Bode plot. Somebody's asking him, what is the loop gain? This, this is the open loop gain. Okay, that's just the power stage times the compensator in here. So I, I don't know what you mean by closed loop gain. That means the closed loop audio susceptibility or the closed loop line to output, uh, the closed loop output impedance where you divide by one plus G sub S, the loop gain. But we always plot the open loop gain. That's the one that gives us the most sensitive stability information. Uh, somebody asked, are we going to support the CPIC and the CHUK? We might do the CHUK. Uh, not the CHUK. We, we might do the CPIC. We'll never do the CHUK. There's just not enough people build those um and you know it's, it's a big investment to do another topology in here uh the cpic if we do it will be a coupled cpic i have no interest in a non-coupled cpic the the control characteristics are not very good and the ripple characteristics so you just couple the inductors together and it looks a lot like a buck boost in terms of um in terms of the control characteristics and that one is actually much easier for us to implement, but we may do it, we don't know. Okay, four switch bug boost, we have that indeed, yes. Do we have more topologies available? Well, you don't because we're a designer, so we have to know your entire circuit. If you want a new circuit designed by our program, then there's a big engineering investment to, uh, to do that. Selection of control mode, all right, we'll talk about that. We're going to get on to current mode. Right, excellent. Okay, so that's that's our voltage mode control. Now, let me just point to one of the little problems that we run into when we're looking at the loop gain. Voltage mode control. You know, I, I like to build tools that are going to be useful to me in a development and also useful to you. So we have this thing here where we raise the input voltage. So we go all the way up to max and we watch the crossover go over towards our target and then we drop down to min again and we see it dropping down to about half of that so we've got moving input line and then we've got moving power in here oh, I, i'm sorry yeah moving power and that shifts the q a little bit and you know going through all the permutations here it's a little bit time consuming so we've added a feature in here called a multi-loop sweep. If you click on that button, it's gonna run through the permutations for you. It's gonna calculate nine loop gains, and then it will present them to you. So this is our first, first uh, indication that things don't always look good in uh, voltage mode control. So we got all these curves here, which look good. They cross over a nice high frequency, 10 kilohertz. These last three curves are 10% load, we've gone discontinuous mode. So the system has a different phase margin, it has a very low crossover frequency. It's hard to come up with a compensator that will take care of both voltage mode and, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, just discontinuous mode and continuous mode in a voltage mode converter. So that's one of the big drawbacks of voltage mode control. Somebody is asking about digital compensators. It doesn't make any difference. Does it make voltage mode control easier? No, it doesn't, because you have to write a thousand lines of code to do the same thing versus hooking a resistor up. So it's just different. If you're if you're conversant in digital, by all means use digital. But life, no, it's it's exactly the same. At its best, digital control will get the same performance of voltage mode as, as analog control and normally there's going to be some phase delay in there so you're going to lose a bit of phase margin in the system but all my comments here yeah if you want to put digital compensation on it click on that there's going to be a delay the phase is going to roll off a little bit harder 
That's all you're going to see in our program. We, we don't get so much into digital control. There's just too, too many other things that we have to uh, deal with. Uh, Zeta converter, never seen one used except in research papers. So no, we're not, we're not going to do that. What we try to cover here is the bread and butter converters for everybody. Okay, voltage mode. Everybody got that. A little bit of a problem, discontinuous mode, but output impedance looks all right. Audio, 100 times rejection, that doesn't look too bad. Now let's go talk a little bit about current mode. And let me go to the next slide first. Start here. What is current mode? Well, instead of just sensing the output voltage and feeding it back through an error amplifier, we also sense the current in the circuit. That can be the switch current here, where we actually put a current transformer or a resistor in series with switch, or we sense the drop across a FET. And then we use the control, the, the current signal here as our, as our ramp signal in the converter. And then our error amplifier controls the peak of that current. So this is what was defined as current mode control when somebody gave it a name back in, I think it was 1978 when this first came out. Um, I, I started in this industry in 1980 and we discovered current mode control or we discovered a paper on current mode control from nasa around the same time and used that in the company i was working at so i've been using current mode control since 1980 and i'll, I'll be honest with you in a, in a production power supply i haven't seen an lc filter response in 40 years <laughs> once you once you've done current mode control you never you never go back because uh it's always better in a control system to sense another state variable, always. You could always make the gain on that state variable zero and get back to voltage mode if you want to, but if you've got more information about your system, it's better to use that information. It's just kind of like, uh, you know, driving a car. You all have a, you know, mileometer on your car, or kilometer, whatever the word is, on your car that tells you how far you've gone but you certainly wouldn't drive just by looking at the distance you've traveled. You have a speed, speedometer too. So that's the derivative of the, of the distance. Same thing with a, with a power supply. Here's the voltage, voltage. Voltage is the integral of the inductor current. You're gonna get much better control of a system when you look at both the state and the state that's feeding it, the derivative of that state. Okay. So current mode control is, is an interesting thing. When I first came into power supply design, I'd done multivariable control in the system, and I saw the first power supply that was using sensing of the current. I said, oh, look, multi, multi, uh, multivariable feedback in a system. The big thing about current mode, and there's really two types of current mode, and it's not average current mode versus instantaneous or peak current mode. It's a little more subtle than that. If we look at the waveforms of the current here, this guy either could be the waveform on the inductor, which we could sense, or it can be the waveform on the switch, which is the same waveform during the on time. The interesting thing about current mode is, are you using the slopes of the current as the modulator waveform? And that's a really big and important question. If you just filter it all out, and you average the current so much that you can't see the ripple anymore, you've done a lot of attenuation of that ripple. And then some people refer that to average current mode control, but a good average current mode control actually leaves the ripple in there because this ripple voltage that comes in is what gives us some of the really nice features of current mode control. So don't think there's average mark, mark current mode and there's peak current mode. There's current mode, and then there's decision. Do I use the ripple as my modulator, or do I not use that ripple and just make it a really slow feedback in the system? Isn't current mode control a loop within a loop? It is a loop within a loop, but again, you can get into a little trouble there. The crossover of the current loop is typically around one sixth 
of the crossover frequency of the switching frequency, the crossover of the voltage loop is around one tenth. So you can't say it's embedded deep inside, and you know the current loop is crossing over much higher. They're they're in the same ballpark of that. Okay, so that's our current mode, and. One of the big deals about current mode that everybody knows, I have a list of seven that we teach in our workshops, but you know, I don't have all the time to do that here. But this is multi-phase control, where you sense the current in each power stage and you control multiple power modules in parallel. So every one of them is going to current share inside a stack system. So if you need to provide I don't know what the numbers are these days, a thousand amps to a processor. You can't do that with a single module. You do it with 10 modules at 100 amps. You sense the current and you control them all to the same peak current, average current, whatever you want to do, but you control the current and then the voltage afterwards. So everybody, of course, knows, knows, um, whoops, sorry, the multi-phase module advantage of current mode control. Does voltage bandwidth have to be lower than current bandwidth? No, nope, it doesn't. They can both be the same. The voltage bandwidth could be higher than the current bandwidth and the current loop is still gonna push it up. So early papers talked about when you do current mode control, you got a really high frequency current loop and then the voltage loop is much lower. That turned out to be wrong later on. They're both in the same ballpark and they both impact each other. Just because you cross over after the current loop is crossed over, it doesn't mean you're not getting benefits from it. It's still making a big difference to your phase margin. Okay. Some of you talked about the download from the website. Um, we tried to send another file to everybody this morning. That didn't work. And the file we uploaded last night has, it's looking for a module that's not there. So uh, we're going to send you all a link to download the demo software so you don't have that problem anymore. If any of you are on our Facebook group, Power Supply Design Center, I put that file on there. You can go download it from there. Okay. Let's go back in now to running current mode in the program. So first we'll look at voltage mode control. Look at our loop. We did a compensator, power stage, and then the loop gain of the system. So let's leave that there. And let's just on the fly change to Voltage mode selected. Current mode control. Current mode Boom. selected. There you go. And the beauty of current mode is that the LC filter's gone. That's what I meant when I said to you, I haven't seen an LC filter in the wild in 40 years. We measure it in our course. We teach voltage mode control in our course. But when it's time for us to build real world converters, always current mode, we always want to cancel out the LC filter of the system. Power stage details. What are we looking at with current mode? Watch out for the app notes that tell you it's a DC gain and a pole, a single pole. Current mode is not a single pole system. It's a three pole system. There's two more poles at half the switching frequency. And then we control the Q of those by adding a ramp to the system. So we've actually switched from a second order voltage mode control to a third order current mode control, but two of those poles are out at half the switching frequency. And uh, I'll show you a fun little thing here that you can play with. Let's put our input spec down to 24 volts here, or 25 volts. No, let's do 24. 24 volts, and then the output is 12, click OK. And then we go look at the loop again. You are using current mode control. And this is a fun thing to see with current mode interactively. So here's the power stage. Single pole. Don't think that's all there is. Most of the app notes tell you that's all there is, but this is coming at you. Double pole right here. One pole, two, three. Use this form to redesign the loop. This double pole here is being controlled by the ramp. So if we reduce the ramp here, we see we can reshape the loop in that region. 
So now we're getting down to a small value. Let's look at our input line. Let's go down to the minimum input. There you go. There's your double pole kicking in. Okay. Ignore the second double pole at your risk. Okay. When you read an app note, it says it's a single pole system. Watch out. This is coming to get you. So now we can Use go. Use this form to redesign the loop. We can recompensate again, put the ramp back in there. And this is exactly how we do it in the lab. And this is exactly how we do it in the real world. People say, hey, I want the equation for doing that. It's like, great, start with the equation, but then measure this. You'll find yourself tweaking this in the lab to make sure that you don't see any peaking at that frequency there. So power stage details, here's our pole zeros. Here are the equations some of you will want to play with. Here's your single pole right here, ESR0, power stage pole. Here's the double pole at half the switching frequency. Here's the ramp affecting the Q of that double pole. Somebody asked a question really early, what about average versus um, peak current mode control? Well, in my world, if I was using average current mode control, I'd let some of the ripple through. So the equations stay essentially the same. If you want to be in the in-between world where you're doing a good amount of filtering of the ripple, we have a paper on that that you can go find, I think on ResearchGate, where we did average current mode control analysis. It was pretty horrible. Uh, I wouldn't encourage that for a dissertation for anybody. It's not fun. <laughs> anyway, so there you are. So there's our power stage. Compensation that we add in here, integral, lead, and then a pole. So we put a zero just before we want to cross over. And then we put a pole to keep the noise going down. And we don't try to line the zero up with the pole here. We're not trying to do that. There's no need to cancel that. So we end up with a loop that looks like this. Minus one slope, minus two slope, minus one when it crosses over, ends up with a minus three slope here. Okay. Can I please repeat what the power stage prediction is? Let's turn off this. This is what your power stage is going to look like, the theory. If you want to bring in some measurements from our AP310 or the Ridley box, you can overlay it on top of this. And then of course, we all know measurements never quite come in like predictions. You can, you can work with the measurements instead of the predictions. This is the prediction, three poles, Here's the transfer functions for you, okay? All good. All right. Multi-phase converters, yes, you've got the double poles at half the switching frequency, and then you may have beating frequencies as well. You have to put ramps in, depending on where you're operating. If you're doing 48 to 12, you're at 25% duty cycle, you don't really need a ramp. If you're getting close to that 50% duty cycle, the ramp has to go in there. And uh, that gets us to our loop gain. Now, here's the fun thing with loop gain. So instead of me tweaking the voltage up and down and the load up and down, let's do that multi-loop thing again, where we go over the full, full variation range for current mode control. Uh, seven loop gains plotted, nine loop gains. There you go. All right, once you've seen this family of plots here versus what voltage mode did where the gain collapsed at DCM, that will be the last time you use voltage mode control. Doesn't matter, even if I go discontinuous, all these curves come in together. And then the crossover here just clusters fairly close to each other. But, you know, CCM current mode is a single pole system, then a double pole. Discontinuous mode, current mode is a single pole system and the double pole goes away. So it's always looking at lower frequencies like a single pole system. So that's one of the beauties of uh, current mode right here. Okay. So there we go versus the, what the voltage mode did in that case when we changed the variables. Now let's go look at some output impedance. Here's my output impedance current mode. So this is two-step process. I start with the blue curve, which is what the open loop converter would be. Then I put current mode on it, so it changes it. It raises it in this region. 
drops it down at the resonance, and then it comes together when it's all capacitors. And then here's my closed loop. On this screen here, again, this is a great thing to teach with all the professors out there. That's current mode. Voltage mode. Selected. Voltage mode. Voltage mode is peaking out right around minus 28 dB. Current mode is peaking out right around minus 28 dB. No difference. In this region here, so if you look down at 10 hertz, current mode is minus 75. Voltage mode. Voltage mode selected. It's minus 90. So voltage mode is better here, but does anybody really care? No, you really care here. You care about 120 hertz, you know, things like that, or, or wherever your noise frequency is coming from. But voltage mode, current mode, they're pretty much even in terms of output impedance. So when we look at step load, waveforms, and then look at the output voltage. Let's get rid of our modulation. No modulation. Okay. And now let's put our step load back in 80% to 100%, right there. And our control mode is voltage mode right now. So let me fix the scale and go. Voltage mode selected. That's voltage mode, current mode. Current mode selected. Voltage mode. Voltage mode selected. Current mode. Current mode selected. Okay, not sure. Oh, I know why there, because we are at the low line, and you notice there that current mode does much better than voltage mode. So that's because I go to the control design again. We're using current mode control. Put that back to voltage mode. Voltage mode selected. When I've got 24 volts on the input, I'm crossing over down around five kilohertz. If I go up to the maximum input, the loop changes. Great. So now if I go to the waveforms again, there's... Voltage mode selected. Voltage mode. Current mode selected. Current mode. Oh, current mode's still doing better on us. Okay, that's a bit of a surprise. I'm, I'm not sure what I'm changing there. Maybe, maybe my, my res, sorry, I think my vertical scale is changing. Control mode. Control mode. Voltage mode selected. Uh, it's not that. So even though we're looking at our, our small signal transfer functions, we're getting things going on here that we didn't expect on the step load. But, you know, neither of them are too bad. Let's go look at the power supply rejection ratio. So, sorry, turn that waveform on again, go to steady state, and put some modulation on the, on the input. And okay, let's go voltage mode. Voltage mode selected. And let's change our modulation to one kilohertz. One, two, three. Update. Okay, there's the noise that's getting through voltage mode control. Change it to current mode. Current mode there's the noise that's getting through current mode. Okay, big, big difference. Output impedance, voltage not such selected. a big deal. Noise rejection current of the power supply, selected. huge deal with current mode. Okay, huge deal with current mode. Increase the ramp. Right. Show it reverting back to the. Oh yeah, I changed I changed something in there, didn't I? Yeah. Obviously, I'm doing a lot of things here. When you do voltage mode versus current mode, the comparison of that step load is pretty similar, actually. All right. Let me let me look at a couple of questions here. Why is output impedance important? Because that tells you the step load. So you want to see that full output impedance. It will tell you what all the step loads will be that you might apply to it. Most voltage mode controllers, no, I won't say have feed forward in them to improve the PSSR, PSRR. Indeed, they do. So let's do voltage mode control now. Voltage mode selected. And let's do voltage mode with feed forward. Feed forward Ooh, voltage mode selected. Look at that. Voltage mode. Voltage mode selected. And feed forward. Feed forward voltage mode selected. And let's 
auto scale, fix vertical. Let's do that again. So there's voltage mode. Feed forward voltage mode selected. And feed forward voltage mode and current mode. Current mode selected. Right, so current mode wins there still. It's still about three times better. But here's my thing about uh, feed forward voltage mode. First of all, most controllers don't do that. Most controllers just do a normal car, uh, voltage mode control. To me, voltage mode control with feed forward is half baked current mode. You're grabbing one voltage that you need, and not the other one. And that's where things miss a little bit because when I go voltage mode with feed forward, so, and then I do my multi loop sweep again. Oops, that's voltage mode, sorry. Sorry, that was current mode. Let me go voltage mode. Okay, and sweep it again. There's our nine loop. So what we achieve with voltage mode feed forward is that the continuous mode all stays the same gain, all stays the same crossover. Great, that's an advantage of feed forward voltage mode. Discontinuous mode still doesn't work. Okay, so that's why I say feed forward voltage mode control is just kind of half baked current mode. It's doing part of the part of the solution, but not the whole thing. You still got a resonance to deal with. How much Q you're going to have there? How much is your phase going to drop during that? It's going to change as you operate the converter. It's going to change with temperature. I don't like LC filters. I like to get rid of them with the current mode control. But yes, voltage mode control with feed forward is a step in the right right direction. Let's have a look. What questions? Is there an application where voltage mode could be advantageous? We're going to talk about that next. Let's go to one more application here back at waveforms. Ah, I said I changed the ramp, right, John? Yeah, change the ramp and show okay. it reverting. Control design. Let me, do, voltage mode control. let me do the pole zeros it's right here. I'd forced a ramp on the system. Let's reset that ramp. Okay. Don't want to have that ramp because that's locking up our voltage mode system. And now let's go back to our waveforms and our step load again. Let's get rid of the modulation. No modulation. Okay. Continue. And step load. Right there. Oops. Auto scale. There is feed forward voltage mode selected. There's feed forward voltage mode control on the step load. There's regular voltage mode voltage control mode on the selected. step load, which is bigger because there's less gain. And then there's current mode selected. Current mode. Okay, there you go. So voltage mode. Voltage mode selected. Current mode. It's the same overshoot. It's a, it's not such a nice characteristic. Afterwards, the current mode is nicely damped. Voltage mode is not. Okay. But you know, not enough to change your control scheme just based on the step load. All right, here we go. Now let's do a bigger step load. So let's step from 10% to 100%. Whoa, what happens there? So this is our voltage mode being stepped upwards. And then this is the voltage mode being stepped downwards. So you see very different responses here and here. This one is stepping into discontinuous mode. So this is not good, everything that's going on here. We don't, we don't like this. So voltage mode just doesn't do well with that bigger step load. Let's hit that with current mode. Current mode selected. And there you go. Oh, change, scale change there as well. Let's. Uh, Go back to voltage mode. Voltage mode selected. All right. Fix the scale. And then change to current mode again. Current mode selected. All right. Current mode. Voltage mode. Voltage mode selected. Okay. So current mode is handling this large signal transient much better. And that's all about the wind up of the uh type 3 compensator it just can't slew fast enough so it's not about the small signal it's not about a small step load the big step load is much more important when comparing current mode and voltage mode so when you see these theoretical papers saying well current mode voltage mode voltage mode is better on output and beams it's like no it's not actually because when you do large signal steps current mode wins this one hands down okay 
So that's that one. Now, let me look at a couple of questions here. <sighs> so many questions. Can you highlight some, John? Sure. All right. Adding a cap bank to the load, does that help? Let's go back to current mode. Current mode selected. Okay. If I don't like this overshoot, 12.4 volts, you know, it's too much. Just bump your capacitor up. Of course, that's exactly what we do. So we bump the capacitor up. Now, this is something that's fun to do in our program because every time I bump this capacitor up, I redesign the compensator. You've got to design all the R's and C's of the compensator. Then you simulate. If you try doing this in LT Spice or Simplis or PCM, whatever you're doing, you've got to increase the capacitor, plot the control to output, redesign the compensator, and then come back and run a simulation again. So you've probably got about a 20 minute turnaround time in doing that. In here, you can determine what's the output cap that I need to get the step load response that I really need. You can do it really, really fast. Let's reset that back to the beginning. Okay. All right. Now we get on to the good stuff, right? You can read all this, you know all this hopefully many of you. Most of the current research papers claim that current mode control has a faster transient response than voltage mode control. Yes, it can. Uh, they always have a basis of comparison that depends on where they design the compensator. The settling time is designed by the zeros and you put them in different places for current mode control and voltage mode control. In general, current mode control is a better response. And yes, it's going to be faster. Would I trust a research paper on that? Not really, because they're not looking at the large signal transients. But current mode control, so I've never used anything but 40 years. What are we seeing now is people are drifting away from current mode control. And it's because of all this GAN stuff coming on and high integration and point of load. So what we have in our, let's see, hold that up there. Here's my little GAN circuit here. And if you look at that, just that little silvery blue part there, that is the half bridge of my buck converter. That's the switch, the diode, and the driver. And there isn't any room in there for a current sensor. So as people are going up and they're integrating tighter and tighter, they want a buck converter without any real snubbers in it. They get to get the layout really tight on here. So this here is about, um, about two and a half by four millimeters. There's the cap, okay? You are not gonna insert a current sensor in here. You are not gonna sense the on resistance of these FETs. They're down around three milliohms. And they're switching so fast that you can't, you just can't get the information and get a clean signal to do current mode. At the same time, digital is coming along. It's very hard for digital to watch a moving current signal and try to use that as the trigger. Actually, it's not hard, but everybody does, does it wrong, in my opinion. Um, so this is leading the push back to voltage mode. And I, I think it's a mistake because there, there are things you can do that will work much better. And many people are already doing them, but they tend to keep quiet about it and it doesn't make you know the topics of uh, research where does the answer live on this for modern converters this is the 19 uh 2020 here is 1960 1970 okay so 60 years old technology way back at the beginning of the converters it didn't look at the current in the inductor or the switch or the diode, they put a little extra winding on the inductor, they integrated it and built the current ramp with the integrator. Okay. And uh, this is somebody just asked, how about using sensorless current mode control? Well, it's not sensorless, I've still got to sense things, but it is lossless sensing. And in the control world, this is an observer. We can't measure the current state directly because it's hard. And we run into that all the time in motor drives and big systems. You can't measure things. So you est them, estimate them. You look at the voltages, you integrate them, and you recreate the current. It's an observer, an estimator, a state estimator, whatever you want to call it. And this is what you should be doing as you go up in frequencies and you go up in noise levels. Okay, this kind of technique. Do you need to do it with an inductor? 
No, you don't need to put a second winding on an inductor because you just want the difference in the voltages here and you do some waveform processing on these voltages. You can do it analog, you can do it digital, but you should be doing it. Don't, don't go just straight um, voltage mode when this, this is available to you. So we have some breadboards here that our interns did last year. This is a EPC converter that we ran. You see the board there mounted on our, you know, test bed here that we use it on. Here's my inductor that we wound. And then coming off the back of the inductor is a little sense winding on there. And that, all it costs you is a couple of turns of wire in the inductor. I don't know if you can see that, hopefully. And then you process those waveforms. And there's many, many different ways to process these. I think over the last 30 years, we have uh, we've advised about half a dozen companies on how to implement this all the way from you know IBM mainframes and servers back in the 1980s to um, class D audio amplifiers. You know, there's many, many applications where people need to implement current mode and they don't know how because they don't have a sense it. This is the way you do it as you go higher in frequencies. And I have at least 20 different implementations of these. Now, here's where you see, okay, here I'm feeding forward the voltage on that inductor and then the output voltage. And the difference between the two is the voltage on the inductor. That's why I say voltage mode feed forward is just grabbing one of those nodes and not the other one. It's not processing the waveform properly. So that's what I call my half-baked current mode control. It's doing half the job, it's not doing the other half of the job. Okay. Now in other fields of uh, control, this is, this is common, very common to do this kind of thing. In power electronics, uh, power supply design, it's less common and it's because we've got this complicated thing where we're using the ramps to be the modulator. We're not just sensing things slowly and bringing them back down. Okay. All right. If you want to read about all of this, I probably have the dubious claim to fame of having thought about more about current mode than anybody else on the planet at this point, starting way back when. First, you can download our book, which is the full analysis, which I did in 1991. And then about 25 years after that, I published a whole bunch of follow-on papers. There's links here you can go to that explained all the other types of analysis that existed, how they did it, what the different papers were, Middlebrook's paper, Lee's paper, MIT's paper, and so on. And it brings it all together to explain what happened in the analysis of current mode control. Okay. You don't really need anything else. Nothing's really happened, you know, since all this work was done. You know, I worked with Volperian on getting the model and everything's been pretty set. What's new is what is old. It's the AC sensing of current mode, integrating of waveforms and so on. Um, are there other ways to sense the current? Yes, of course there are. There's the DC resistant current sensing for a high current application. I hate that because it's a really, really tiny signal with a really, really big offset and you're trying to regulate things really, really tightly. Sometimes it's all you got. So you will see that. I wouldn't recommend you have a resistive sensing and then try to use the waveforms to get true current mode. Use that resistive sensing perhaps to get DC sharing, sense the current like this to get the AC sharing. And there's some chips out that do these kind of things. You never know what they're doing inside the chip, so I don't know if they do them right or not. But no, D DC, but <laughs> DC sensing is is there's just not enough signal in there. Um, in a average and out of voltage loop control, as I say, average current mode control, you should let the ripple through. It's basically the same. If you do good, a good job in average current mode control, it should look like peak current mode control. You should get the same bandwidth. This peak current mode control. Okay, so there's no difference. So our program, when it's doing this, it's assuming if you're using average current mode control, you're doing it well. Okay. All right. If you want more information, we will send you all the link to download the demo program that works, that doesn't have the little bug in there we have. I say, if you're on our Power Supply Design Center group on Facebook, you can download that file right away. It's, I put it up there this morning, you can go get that. And four and a half thousand people are on the uh, Facebook group. So please, please come join us on that. But you can get the demo of this and run this yourself. Uh, 
obviously everybody we we run workshops and um you know th this is nice doing the webinars here but i can only give you theory i can't give you hardware to play with everything changed when you measure the hardware and then that's why we have our power supply design workshops so we go through the theory we look at the software then we make measurements on the real converter and then you say okay what do i do now do i refine my models do i live with the measurements that's one of the reasons we still do a lot of measurements okay we have frequency response analyzers of ridley engineering ap300 and the ridley box now available uh facebook group please come join lots of people are there i know it's facebook people don't like it but it's okay facebook is all right for groups really good groups good discussions going on there free book go get that and come join our design center if you go to the ridley engineering website you go to the design center and there's almost 200 articles there now all of these webinars will be available on the um on the design center and you can come uh, come get those after the event you can also download the software we'll get the uh the fixed version of the software that's going to run for you as soon as this webinar is over uh lots of you ask about the ridley box coming out soon we first orders are shipping actually next week on this and there's a lifetime license for ridley works it's a four channel frequency response analyzer it's a four channel oscilloscope and it's got an embedded computer in there everything you need just add a screen and a mouse and this whole presentation is actually running from a ridley box right now so we're using the computer it's got an internet connection on it so you know when you add up all the parts of the ridley box you're actually getting a free frequency response analyzer so it's a great deal and then the lifetime license for ridley works in here is uh it's a pretty cool thing as well this is how we design we're using these boxes now in our teaching uh to do um to teach all of this and we're gonna come up with some advanced remote learning if anybody is interested in that we're actually going to have some hardware learning that you can sign up for it'd be a lot like our workshop but you don't have to come here you don't have to expose yourself to any travel risk okay and then of course we have the ap310 for all the aerospace uh, military customers who need the full calibration full certification and then the full range of drives and everything the ap310 steps in and that that's what we always compare our ridley box to we try to get measurements as good as that there's for some areas where the ap310 is going to do better with this much better noise reduction and it's great big uh, signal ranges it, it's still the standard of the industry but this one here is what we're using and teaching now and we're using this for a lot of our customers so this is going to be a very popular frequency response analyzer and scope scope is really good too so this is our debug tool that we have um i will hang around a little bit i'll answer some questions those of you that have to go uh thanks very much for coming we will have another webinar in about three weeks and um, always interested in feedback from you what you'd like to see as uh, topics i'd like to slow down a little bit and do loop compensation for you and some loop measurements to show you how we do this in the real world if you'd like to see that um, but we're open to many any ideas that you that you might have on that can you use current mode with load feed forward uh people have tried that not a good idea because it's so noisy it's so noisy to grab that um that load current you just can't break in there and get a good signal without messing up the uh the the compensator oh, somebody thought it's a wonderful webinar thank you very much i like that does the ridley box require a one-to-one -one transform for body plots well if you zoom in on there it's built in we put the injection transformer inside the box so you no longer you know we have other accessories here we've got a line injector for doing the noise rejection output impedance impedance test kit differential probes if you want to go high voltage but the isolating transformer is inside so no you don't need to need to get that anymore are we going to do llc in the software we'll get there eventually if everybody on this uh, webinar bought a copy of our software we'll get to the llc right away so it's all a matter of funding and uh, resources here to get the other ones done uh can you use current mode for a wide input voltage range absolutely the wider the range the better current mode control tends to do hall effect sensors sure they'll give you dc information but if you can build an observer and process the waveforms with no loss and no parts in there why why wouldn't you do that um 
Non-linear control for DC to DC converters. What's my opinion? Every controller for DC to DC converters is non-linear. So does the software that costs 2400 come with the box? That's the Ridley Works software. Yes, look, lifetime license Ridley Works in the box. So it doesn't even need to go online and do verification. We do a manual install on these boxes. So if you're inside a lab and you're not allowed to be hooked up to the internet, it doesn't matter. We can, uh, you know, the Ridley Works was still running there. So yes, that, that software is, is in there. Is there a downloadable user manual for the Ridley Box? Yeah, working on that. It's, uh, it's being written as we speak. It will be shipped next week, so it will be done. Gosh, a lot of questions here. A lot of questions. <laughs> Am I going to do a webinar on digital control? No, go to Hamish Laird for that. He's the world's expert on digital control. Uh, I'm too busy with all the analog issues. But remember, when you build a power supply, you've got to make the analog part work first. Then you put your digital on. So most of the power supply stays the same. Digital is not a big deal. When you look at your circuit, you've got one control chip or a different control chip. Input output signals are the same. So, you know, programming a digital is not my thing, never will be. And, uh, you know, I, I've done it, but uh, doing production code on that is a lifetime's endeavor. So I leave that to the to the experts to do. Normal Bode box only gets to 100 kilohertz. The impressive meets 20 megahertz. Thank you. I don't know what you mean by a normal Bode box. Our, uh, our uh, AP310 goes to 30 megahertz and it goes down to 0 0.01 hertz. So this one will only do one hertz struggle. All of these sampling type FRAs struggle with low frequencies. So we do a good, really good job down to one hertz. Going down to 0.01 would not be possible. It's just too much data to collect with a scope. It's just different processing, the waveforms. How do I compare second file? Why not tantalum caps? Sure. Tantalum caps, if you want tantalum caps, you click on the output capacitor, you fill in the capacitance and the ESR, and then you've got your tantalum capacitors. I try not to use tantalum too much because they do have a tendency to catch fire sometimes. And uh, most of our customers don't like that. But have I done them before? I have. And it's just it's just another capacitor. Uh, Voltage mode, current mode. Please go read the dissertation if you want to see voltage mode versus current mode. I'm only on the first page of questions here. <laughs> it's, it's overwhelming. Right? It is overwhelming. Yeah, yep. yeah. Send us questions. Um, please, please come join the Facebook group. All these questions are good for the Facebook group. Okay, you've got 4,000 experts on there, and they will help you answer all of this. So, you know, it's a difficult field we're in. And you need help, so come join that community. And they always get first notification of the uh, upcoming webinars as well. In multi-phase, do we sense just one converter and control all of the others? I've seen everything done. Um, there, there are so many different ways of sensing current mode control. You know, if if you have a specific need and a specific project, you know, we can help you with that. You know, we do a lot of consulting on that, and we help people out with getting that that done. Do inverters, UPS, common use, common, common mode control? Uh, pretty much everybody is sensing the current somewhere. They should be. If you want to protect your converter properly, you know, you're sensing the line current somewhere and processing it. Can you explain where the two poles of the half switching frequency come from? Go. Oh, you got that, John. Thank you. Current mode for three phase. Current mode, put it everywhere. Motor control everywhere. Sense the current. It will help you. And yes, the power stage prediction is the plant's loop gain. What is my approach for compensating for all operating points? Use current mode control and you compensate for all operating points by default. Voltage mode control, you cannot do that. It will not cover discontinuous mode. It only can cover, covers one or the other in there. Okay. How to flatten the peak of the output impedance and make the curve flat. Why on earth would you want to do that? Uh, I've seen some papers written about flattening the output impedance. And I, they, they completely mystify me. Because when I look at control design, output impedance, this peak here is determined by the capacitor and the bandwidth. So the only way to flatten the output impedance is to raise the impedance down here. 
the low frequency is why on earth would you want to do that would you really want to degrade the performance of that power supply by raising its output impedance uh <laughs> i do not subscribe to that theory just make that output impedance as low as you can for a voltage source now when you go out beyond crossover that's up to the board layout people they've got to put on their caps and their smaller caps and smaller caps and they've got to deal with the transmission lines and the layout of the pc board there's a whole realm of designers that do that so there we're out beyond you know the crossover frequency of the loop and now you're talking about layout so that part there yeah you don't want dips and valleys in that part but down here no you keep you keep the impedance as low as you possibly can Constant current output simulation. Uh, yes, one thing we do in our program is we have a spice link. So if you want to do most of your design in here in our program, and you want to because all the work is done for you, the simulation is fast. If you need something unusual like turning it into a current source, dump it into LT Spice, go modify the LT Spice file, and then you create what you need to over there. So that was a huge change for us linking to Spice, LT Spice, and now we link to PSIM as well. So we can get great speed out of PSIM. So you could continue design there. You, you refine your designs in, uh, in other places. Voltage mode. Why 45 degrees phase margin is good. Let's show you. It's important. Let's go. Output voltage, and here we have 57 degrees phase margin. Let's this go. Form to redesign the loop. Let's go play with our zero. So we'll put this up to a higher frequency, and as we do that, you can watch the phase margin getting eroded here. Okay. There's 45 degrees. Now you start seeing this little bit of a solitary response coming in here. Okay. And if we go down beyond that, of phase course. Phase margin is less than 45 degrees. Phase margin is less than 45 degrees. Okay, this is 30, 40 phase degrees. Okay. Margin is less than 45 you can't degrees. tolerate this oscillation phase coming margin on. Phase margin is less than 45 degrees. By the way, phase that gets. Phase margin is less than 45 <laughs> degrees. You can always turn the audio off on our um, program if you don't want to hear that because you're clicking too many buttons. So yeah, the oscillation on the recovery here is a function of the phase margin, okay? If I look at my output impedance right here, and then I play this around. To redesign the loop. Phase margin is less than 45 it's 37 degrees. degrees. Okay, look at this peak here, which is about minus 25 dB, and then I reset that. Now it's 28. So when I eroded the phase margin by lifting up the gain, my peak impedance got worse. Okay, so going below 45 degrees actually makes the impedance grow here. Most people don't know that. They think once they're past crossover, is less than 45 this gets attenuated. But if you don't have phase margin, it makes the output impedance grow in that region. And this is well beyond the crossover frequency. So I think, aha, uh -huh, I didn't get anything by dropping this phase margin here. It gets worse as the phase margin goes down. So hopefully that answers that question. How about... Forty-five degrees in time scale. We've just seen that for correcting the fonts. Can we have adaptive feed forward in voltage mode control? Sure you can, but why wouldn't you use a uh, current mode control? Much easier. Everybody, people will go through enormous contortions to make their voltage mode work. And all they need to do is sense one more voltage, process it properly, all those problems go away. So that's where you should be looking. If you find yourself banging your head against the wall on voltage mode control and really contorting yourself to fit it into something where it doesn't want to fit, you just sense the second voltage and you process it properly and you've got car mode it's easy you need to know how to do it though so go go do some reading uh constant on time controller introduced in the last five to ten years well the constant on time controller came in about 1960 
he already left to answer that question. So constant on-time control, constant off-time control, nothing new. It's all the same. Current mode works better than voltage mode on both of those controllers as well. Oh yeah, I've just flagged a guy doing state space averaging. Uh, state space averaging? Well, right at, the bottom of the list. at the bottom of the list. Do, do, do. Oh my goodness, that's a lot of questions, isn't it? Good question, yeah. <laughs> Currently, we do state space averaging. Okay, well, stop doing that. <laughs> I'm going to do a seminar soon, which is going to be the first third of my seminar. I was going to give an APEC that talks about state space averaging and the Volparian switch model and the current model model. Okay, last time I did state space averaging was 1986. And then when Volparian came out with the switch model, he turned state space averaging contortions into a simple circuit, I've never done it again. Nobody at Virginia Tech has ever done it again. Most of the world hasn't done it again, except for new people to the field and some of the antiquated teachings teaches state space averaging. But it's uh, it was a nice technique, it was a very clever technique. I used to know it better than anybody else because I, I would, apart from Chuck himself, of course, I would do it on so many converters and I loved doing it. But when I stopped doing it, I loved that even more. So yeah, try not to do that. Uh, so compensation in current mode control, it's all in now. I don't know why you need to look now at the paper there. The, the, it all came from what we did about the current mode compensation. And uh, when you're looking at your loop here, okay, here's your equations. You, you will see this Q equation in many of the app notes in many people's papers. Um, these days they tend to make out that they kind of invented the equation, but they didn't. I did. So there it is for the Q. Uh, it's 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 easy enough. Uh, read the papers we've got. They're there. Well, the ones that are in our design center are, you know, we, we don't put too many equations in there. It's different from a very common sense point of view about why the uh, current mode compensation works. But uh, yeah, it's been written up many times. Again, the software, we will make sure we get you all an email with the proper software on it. What is the minimum gain needed? I don't know where you mean there, minimum gain. Uh, for me, always minimize output impedance. You know, I, I always doing that. So I don't know what that question means about raising it up and going flat on that again. I think I have covered most of the questions there. Um, so come and join our Facebook group. We'll be happy to see you there. Uh, we've got your email addresses, so we will let you know when the next webinar is coming along. Probably in about uh, three weeks from now, we'll avoid the July 4th holiday, obviously. Um, it's great to see you all here. Thanks for attending. Thanks for paying attention. And um, so we've got almost 300 people on the line here. Um, and yeah, enjoy your power supplies. Please come read our articles on our website. And uh, you know, uh, if you wanna get the full software, you, it, you will find it saves you so much of your design time. If you're battling away doing all kinds of analysis, you know, we, we turn design into fun. We do it graphically in our software. All the equations are in there, so you get those two, so you don't have to dig into this textbook or that textbook or that textbook. Everything is in there. But this design software will, you know, change your life. If you're a teacher or a student, we have student packages that we have out there uh, that can help students learn all these concepts of control, LC filters, large signal, small signal, everything like that. And if you're writing some papers, uh, you know, our software will help you. It's like, here's the baseline design. If you're trying to do a different type of control, compare it to what we get. And then you will see whether you've got merit in uh, your control or not. So, yep, think about that. And um, we will see you all again in about um, three weeks' time. Thanks very much and stay safe.